Christie's yesterday, a painting by the late Charles Strickland was bought by Mr. Joseph Steen, the distinguished connoisseur, for 3,500 pounds. The painting, 60 by 48, is entitled The Woman of Samaria and represents a woman, native of the Society Islands, lying beside a brook against the background of palms and banana trees. £3,500 for a South Sea lady by the late Charles Strickland. When I first met Charles Strickland, it never occurred to me that he was a genius. I can hardly be blamed for that, since it didn't occur to anyone else, either. To probe the mystery of a nature as curious as Strickland's has the fascination of a detective story. And more than one author has already tried to write it. <coughs> Strickland's son, a schoolmaster, was so embarrassed by the scandals growing up about his father, that he wrote a biography of his own. In this book, Strickland appeared as a perfect husband and a model parent. The young man even quoted a letter his father had written referring to his wife as an excellent woman. But I happen to have seen the whole letter and what Strickland really wrote was, Blast my wife, she's an excellent woman. I wish she was in hell. When so much has been written about Charles Strickland, it may seem unnecessary that I should write more. I'm doing so because his extraordinary life and character are a mystery which no other author has yet solved to my satisfaction. The riddle of Strickland has long been a challenge to me. A challenge I can no longer refuse. I met Charles Strickland shortly after I had written my first novel. By a lucky chance, this book excited some attention and I began to be invited to the houses of people who like to give parties for writing. You see that rather wholesome looking woman over there? She's charming. Who is she? Mrs. Strickland. I want you to talk to her. She's raving about your book. What's she do? She's one of the most harmless of the lion hunters. You've only to roar a little and she'll ask you to luncheon. She adores writers. Why? I don't know. I fancy she's rather simple, poor dear. She thinks we're wonderful. I like her. I think she's nice. Is there a Mr. Strickland? Oh, yes. He's a stockbroker, I think. He's very dull. Have they any children? Uh, yes, a boy and a girl. They're at school. Oh, Mrs. Strickland, this is Geoffrey Wolfe. I don't think I roared very loudly, but Mrs. Strickland invited me to luncheon, and during the summer, I saw her quite frequently. Why have you never let me meet your husband? He's not at all literary. He'd probably bore you to death. Does he bore you? I happen to be his wife. Very fond of him. He doesn't pretend to be a genius. In fact, he doesn't even make very much money on the stock exchange. But he's awfully good and kind. I think I should like him very much. I'll ask you to dine with us, but mind you at your own risk. Don't blame me if you have a dull evening. The party was a purely social function given the cost of Strickland's old dinners to a number of people. Each 
one talk to his neighbor on one side during the soup, fish, and entree, to his neighbor on the other side during the roast, sweet, and savory. Mr. Strickland played his part with decorum, but he did not talk very much. And I fancy there was towards the end a look of fatigue in the faces of the women on either side of him. Once or twice, Mrs. Strickland's eyes rested on him anxiously. Finally, I had the opportunity to examine him at my ease. He seemed commonplace. It was obvious that he had no social gifts, but those a man could do without. He had no eccentricity even to take him out of the common run. He was just a good, honest, plain man. One would admire his excellent qualities, but avoid his company. I thought of him and his devoted wife and his well-bred children as a typical middle-class family to whom nothing adventurous or unconventional could possibly happen. If I had not formed so positive an opinion of Strickland, I should not have been so surprised by the news that awaited me when, in response to an urgent letter from Mrs. Strickland, I hurried back to London from a holiday in the country. Her brother-in-law, Colonel McAndrew, was warming his back at an unlit fire. Mrs. Strickland herself seemed at a loss how to begin. It was an awkward moment. <coughs> well, you may as well know it. That blackguard has deserted her. Strickland? She's bolted. Gone off to Paris with a woman. But that's incredible. I can't believe it. He wrote to her himself from Paris. Said that he'd made up his mind not to live with her anymore. And what reason did he give? None. Well, what reason could he give except that he'd gone off with a woman? Seventeen years. What about seventeen years? Well, they have been married. I never liked him. She ought never to have married him. What on earth are she and the children going to live on? He left them without a penny. What's she going to do? There's only one thing for her to do, and that's to divorce him. That's what I was telling her when you came in. Fire in with your petition, my dear Amy, I said. You owe it to yourself, and you owe it to the children. I'm going over to Paris myself to get our proofs. I'd much rather you didn't go, Fred. You know you'd only fight with Charles. I'm going to ask Jeffrey to go over to Paris for me. That's why I asked him to come in today. I'd like you to go now, Fred, dear. Would you mind? I want to speak to Jeffrey alone. Goodbye, dear. I'm sorry I broke down. I'm glad you didn't go away. I can't tell you how sorry I am about all this, but why on earth should you want me to go to Paris? Fred isn't the man to go. He'll only make things worse. I don't know who else to ask. Well, I've not spoken more than ten words to your husband. You'll probably just tell me to go to the devil. That wouldn't hurt you. If you said you'd come on my behalf, he couldn't refuse to listen to you. Why don't you go and see him yourself? You forget he isn't alone. Have you found out who it is he's gone away with? No. No one seems to have an idea. It's so strange. I thought he was perfectly happy. Of course I'll go to Paris if I can do any good, but you'll have to tell me exactly what I'm to do. I want him to come back. But uh, I understood from Colonel McAndrew that you'd made up your mind to divorce him. I'll never divorce him. Tell him that for me. He'll never be able to marry that woman. I'm as obstinate as he is and I'll never divorce him. I have to think of my children. Where's he staying? The Hotel de Berge. I've never heard of it. Fred says it's very expensive. It can't go on. It's horrible in a man of his age with children who are nearly grown up. Tell him our home cries out to him. Talk to him about the past and all we've gone through together. What am I going to say to the children when they ask for him? 
His room is exactly as he left it. It's waiting for him. We're all waiting for him. Please. I'll go, I promise you. I'll do everything I can. Everything. The Hotel de Bells was not at all what I had been led to expect. I couldn't help wondering what sort of woman Strickland could have brought to a place like this. I'm Jeffrey Wolf. I had the pleasure of dining with you last July. Yes, of course. Come in. You're sure it's all right? You're quite alone? I'm delighted to see you. Take a pew. I'm glad you survived those stairs. Um. Oh, thanks. I won't be a minute. How do you like my Tahitian god? I found him in a shop around the corner. You're sure I'm not disturbing you? You're not expecting anyone? Not a soul. Tell me what I can do for you. I've come to see you on behalf of your wife. Oh. Well, in that case, I think we can both do with a drink. Do you like absinthe? I can drink it, but I prefer whiskey. Well, come on, then. We might dine together. You owe me a dinner, you know. Well, certainly. You're quite sure you're alone? Why, yes. As a matter of fact, I haven't spoken to anybody for several days. My French isn't exactly brilliant, you know. I thought I'd tell you at once why I came to see you. I thought somebody would be along sooner or later. Had a lot of letters from Amy. And you know pretty well what I've got to say. I've not read them. Oh, I'm sorry. Beast a job for you, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. Well, look here, you get it over and then we'll have a jolly evening. Well, go on. I'm not too keen on making a public discussion out of this. Well, don't be silly. These people don't understand English anyhow. Speak up. Has it occurred to you that your wife is frightfully unhappy? Will she get over it? Does she deserve to be treated like this? No. Have you any complaint to make against her? None. Well, then, isn't it monstrous to leave her in this fashion after 17 years of married life? Without a fault to find with her? Monstrous. I beg your pardon. Well, so long as you acknowledge that, there doesn't seem to be much more to be said. I don't think there is. I'm sorry. Hang it all, one can't leave a woman without a penny. Why not? How's she going to live? I've supported her for 17 years. Why shouldn't she support herself for a change? She can't. I know, Amy. She'll manage. Don't you care for her anymore? Not a bit. What are your children to think of? If you chuck everything like this, they'll be thrown on the streets. They've had a good many years of comfort, much more than the majority of children have. Besides, somebody will always look after them. When it comes to the point, the McAndrews will pay for their schooling. But aren't you fond of them? Don't you want to have anything to do with them? I liked them well enough when they were kids, but now that they're growing up, I haven't any particular feeling for them. It's just inhuman. I dare say. Everyone will think you a perfect swine. Let them. Won't it mean anything to you that people loathe and despise you? No. Are you sure it won't begin to worry you? Everyone has some sort of conscience. Supposing your wife died, wouldn't you be tortured by remorse? What have you to say to that? Only that you're a blasted fool. I beg your pardon. At all events, you can be faultless about your wife and children. I suppose the law has some protection to offer them. Can the law get blood out of a stone? I haven't any money. I've got about a hundred pounds. What are you going to do when you spend that? Earn some. Why doesn't Amy marry again? She's comparatively young, not unattractive. I can recommend her as an excellent wife. If she wants to divorce me, I don't mind. <laughs> now that is clever of you. 
But you're not going to find things quite as easy as that. I can assure you that nothing you can do will ever induce your wife to divorce you. She's quite made up her mind. My dear fellow, I don't care. It's a matter of brass filing to me, one way or the other. Oh, come now. You mustn't think of such fools as all that. We happen to know that you came away with a woman. Huh? <laughs> I don't see what you find so amusing. <laughs> poor Amy. What poor minds women have got. Love. It's always love. They think a man leaves only because he wants others. Do you think I'd be such a fool as to do what I've done for a woman? Do you mean to say you didn't leave your wife for another woman? Of course not. On your word of honor? <laughs> On my word of honor. Then what in heaven's name have you left her for? I want to paint. But you're 40. Well, that's what made me think it was high time to begin. Have you ever painted? I rather wanted to be a painter when I was a boy, but my father wanted me to go into business. He said there was no money in art. I started to paint about a year ago. The last year I've been going to classes at night. Was that where you went when your wife thought you were playing bridge at your club? That's it. Well, why didn't you tell her? I prefer to keep it to myself. Can you paint? Not yet, but I shall. That's why I came over here. I couldn't find what I wanted in London. I thought perhaps I could here. Yeah. What makes you think you have any talent? I've got to paint. Aren't you taking an awful chance? It could be a frightful sell if at the end you have to acknowledge that you made a hash of it. I've got to paint. Supposing you're never anything more than third rate. Do you think it'll have been worthwhile to give up everything? You are a fool. I don't see why, unless it's foolish to say what's obvious. I tell you, I've got to paint. I can't help myself. When a man falls into the water, it doesn't matter how he swims, well or badly, he's got to get out or else he'll drown. Well, then you won't go back to your wife. Never. She's willing to forget everything and start afresh. She won't make you a single reproach. And she can go to the devil. Look here, if everyone to behave like you, the world couldn't go on. Oh, that's a silly thing to say. Everybody doesn't want to behave like me. The majority of people are perfectly content to do the ordinary thing. What do you want? Why do you not speak to me? Get out. It is not money I want. Get out, I tell you. Shamo! Did you have to be quite so violent? After all, she was paying you rather a compliment. Oh, I bought her a drink the other night. Now I can't get rid of her. Well, still, you didn't have to insult her. That sort of thing makes me sick. Do you know what my impression is? What? I think your wife is well rid of you. My dear fellow, I only hope you can make her see it. But women are very unintelligent. You are a most unmitigated cad. <laughs> now that you've got that off your chest, let's go and have some dinner. Oui, monsieur. Oui, fin, monsieur. Merci. I'm not sure that your husband is quite responsible for his actions. In the old days, they would have said Charles Strickland had a devil. Why don't you go over to him, Amy? We look after the children. Sooner or later, he'll be quite ready to come back. But I don't want him back. I could have forgiven him if he'd fallen desperately in love with someone and run off with her. I should have thought he was led away. Men are so weak and women are so unscrupulous. This is different. I hate him. I'll never forgive him now. Do you mean you could have forgiven him if he'd left you for a woman, but not if he's left you for an idea? You think you're a match for the one, but against the other, you're helpless. I never knew it was possible to hate anyone as much as I hate him. If you want to divorce him, he's quite willing. If there'd been another woman, I'd never have divorced him. Why should I make things easy for her? But now, why shouldn't I? Of course, I'll divorce him. It was several years before I saw Charles Strickland again. At that time, I felt I needed a change from London, and I decided to live in Paris for a while. As soon as I was settled, I went to see my friend, Dirk Sturver. Dirk was a Dutch artist with a knack for painting pictures that sold easily. 
Although he was an indifferent painter himself, he had an unerring eye for discovering talent in other artists. But nature had made him a buffoon. He was naive and emotional, lovable and laughable. I had a real affection for him. I knew that he had married an Englishwoman whom I was now to meet for the first time. that he adored her. I couldn't tell if she loved him, but the smile in her eyes was affectionate, and it was possible that her composure concealed a very deep feeling. Well, what do you think of my wife? Isn't she wonderful? Oh, really, Dirk. Thank you. Won't you sit down? I'm the happiest man alive. Look at her. Doesn't she make a picture? I've seen all the most beautiful women in the world. I've never seen anyone more beautiful than Madame Dirk Ströve. If you don't stop that, Dirk, I shall have to go away. Oh, my poor Shelley. I'm sorry if I vex you. Blanche is too modest to let me paint her, so it's just like in the old student days, I paint the dinner before we eat it. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Tell me, Dirk, have you by any chance run across an artist called Charles Strickland? You don't mean to say you know him? Beast. <laughs> she doesn't like him. I don't like bad manners. You see, I asked him to come here one day and have a look at my pictures. Well, he came, and I showed him everything I had. He, he looked at my pictures and didn't say anything. At last I said, there, that's the lot. And all he said was, I came here to ask you to lend me 20 francs. <laughs> and you will tell the story, Dirk. I hope I never see him again. The fact remains, he's a great artist, a very great artist. Strickland? Oh, it can't be the same man. The one I'm thinking of only began painting a few years ago. That's it. He's a great artist. Impossible. Have I ever been mistaken? I tell you, he has genius. I am convinced of it. In a hundred years, if you and I are remembered at all, it will be because we knew Charles Strickland. Hmm? Yes, that's him. Only he didn't have a beard when I knew him. Can I see his work? Is he having any success? No, he has no success. I don't think he has ever sold a picture. But I know he's a great artist. Dirk, how can you talk that way about his paintings when he treated you as he did? What do you think of them? I think they're awful. Darling, you don't understand. But you know yourself that people only laugh at you when you talk about his pictures. They think you're making a joke with them. Why should you think that beauty is a stone on the beach? for any passerby to pick up. Beauty is something wonderful and strange that the artist creates in torment out of chaos. It isn't always easy to recognize it at first. For that you must have knowledge and sensitiveness and imagination. Why did I always think your paintings beautiful, Dirk? I admired them the very first time I saw them. I don't know where Strickland lives, but I can take you to see him. He goes to a cafe in the Avenue du Clichy every afternoon. We can go over there later on if you like. Hello, Strickland. Hello, Fanny. What do you want? I brought an old friend to see you. I've never seen him in my life. Take your order again tomorrow. Shame, shame, please. <laughs> um, Dirk. Demi blonde. Whiskey soda. Okay. I saw your former wife the other day. The last time you brought me news of her, we had a jolly evening together, didn't we? My friend Dirk tells me you're a great artist. I'm sorry I can't return the compliment. I find you more disgusting than ever. I'm delighted. 
Blanche may be getting anxious. Oh, I'm afraid I better run along. Yes, do. I'll come in tomorrow afternoon. Goodbye, Strickland. Will you let me see your pictures? Why should I? I might feel inclined to buy one. I might not feel inclined to sell one. Are you making a good living? Do I look it? You look half starved. Will you lend me 50 francs? I wouldn't dream of it. Why not? It wouldn't amuse me. Don't you care if I starve? Why on earth should I? What's so funny? You're so simple. You recognize no obligations. No one is under any obligation to you. Wouldn't you feel uncomfortable if I went out and hanged myself because I'd been turned out of my room for not paying the rent? Not a bit. You're bragging. If I really did, you'd be overwhelmed with remorse. Well, try it and see. You know, you surprise me. Why? It's disappointing to find that at heart, you're sentimental. I should have liked you better if you hadn't made that ingenuous appeal to my sympathies. I should have despised you if you'd been moved by it. That's better. You haven't paid for your drink. Blast you. Just a minute. Since you're half starved, maybe I'll buy you a dinner. I thought you didn't care if I starved or not. I don't. All right, then I'd like a decent meal. The transformation that had taken place in Strickland excited my curiosity. But I knew I should learn nothing of his life in Paris if I asked him direct questions. His nature was so contrary that I hoped I might make him talk by pretending to be indifferent. I'm interested in his mental processes. I see. You're a writer and you take a purely professional interest in me. Purely. I suppose you'd like to know what's happened to me during these last few years. Have a cigar. Thanks. The sum he had brought with him from London came to an end. He set about finding some way to make a bit of money. When he told them he was a painter, they gave him work that seemed to be in his line. For months, he lived on a loaf of bread and a bottle of milk a day. He told me with grim humor of the time he had spent acting as guide to tourists who wanted to see the nightlife of Paris. Attic, translating the advertisements of patent medicines which were sent to the medical profession in England. And yet he was unaffected by his hardships, except as they interfered with his painting. Strangely enough, though he needed money so badly, he made no attempt to sell his pictures. Why don't you ever send your work to exhibitions? Don't you want fame? It's something that most artists are not indifferent to. Why should I care for the opinion of the crowd when I don't care tuppence for the opinion of the individual? I wonder if I could write on a desert island with a certainty that no other eyes but mine would ever see what I'd written. I've sometimes thought of an island, somewhere off the map, where I could live and work in a hidden valley among strange trees, alone. Alone. Do you really mean that? Haven't you been in love since you came to Paris? 
I haven't time for that sort of nonsense. <laughs> what are you sniggering at? What's the good of trying to humbug me? I don't know what you mean. Let me tell you. For months, the matter never comes into your head and you think you're finished with it for good and all. At last, you can call your soul your own. You seem to walk with your head among the stars. Then all of a sudden, you can't stand it anymore. And you notice that all the time, your feet have been walking in the mud. And you want to roll yourself in it. And then you find some woman. If she's coarse and vulgar, so much the better. Can you explain that to me? Christmas Day by himself, not even Strickland. With some difficulty, we found where he lived. at once that he was dangerously ill. We provided as well as we could for his immediate needs and then Dirk hurried home. He had something in mind which he would not tell me but for which he needed my moral support. Dear one, Strickland is very ill. He may be dying. He's alone in a filthy attic, and there isn't a soul to look after him. I want you to let me bring him here. Oh, no. Please don't say no, darling. I couldn't bear to leave him where he is. I shouldn't sleep a wing for thinking of him. I have no objection to your nursing him. But he'll die. Let him. Oh, you don't mean that, darling. I beg you to let me bring him here. Maybe we can save him. He'll be no trouble to you. I'll do everything. We'll make him up a bed in the studio. We can't let him die like a dog. Do you think if you were ill that he'd lift a finger to help you? What does that matter? I'd have you to nurse me. Besides, I'm different. I'm not an importance. Haven't you any spirit at all? You lie on the ground and ask people to trample on you. Darling, he's a genius. But it's not only because of that I want to bring him here. It's because he's a human being. And he's ill and poor. I'll never have him in my house. Never. Jeffrey, tell her it's a matter of life and death. We can't leave him in that wretch at all. Of course, it would be easier to nurse him here, but it may not be very convenient. I have an idea someone will have to be with him day and night. Darling, it's not you who would shirk a little trouble. If he comes here, I go. I don't recognize you. You are always so kind. Oh, for goodness sake, let me be. You're driving me crazy. <laughs> Oh, sweetheart, don't, darling. Oh, sweetheart, don't, don't, please. Darling. I can't bear it when you cry. Don't, dear. I beseech you not to bring Strickland here. But why? I don't know why. But there's something about him that frightens me. He terrifies me. He'll do us some great harm. I know it. I feel it. If you bring him here, something terrible will happen to us. Because we do a kind action. You are my wife. You are dearer to me than anyone in the world. No one shall come here without your entire consent. But haven't you been in bitter distress once, when a helping hand was held out to you? 
You know how much it means. Wouldn't you like to do someone a good turn when you have the chance? Bring Strickland here, Dirk. I'll do all I can for him. Strickland was ill for six weeks. At one time, it looked as if he could not live more than a few hours. I am certain that only Dirk's devotion pulled him through. Dirk gave up his work entirely to Nurse Strickland. He squandered money on delicacies to tempt his appetite and endured his ridicule with unfailing good nature. capable but a devoted nurse. She and Strickland never spoke to each other but he kept looking at her with a curious irony. When finally Strickland was able to get up, he made no effort to move back to his own quarters. with Dirk's attitude. I didn't understand it. The explanation, more startling than anything I had anticipated, came when Dirk arrived at my apartment one night in a state of extreme agitation. I've known what was happening for a fortnight. I think I knew it before she did. But it was so incredible, I just couldn't believe it. This afternoon, I couldn't stand it anymore. I went to Strickland and I told him I thought he was well enough to go back to his own place. I wanted a studio myself. No one but Strickland would have needed telling. What did he say? He laughed. You know how he laughs. Not as if he were amused, but as if you were a fool. He said he'd go at once. He began to put his things together. I was afraid something was going to happen. I wished I hadn't spoken. Going with Strickland, Dirk. I can't live with you anymore. Mm -hmm. 
Don't look at me, you idiot. I didn't ask her to come. I can't help myself, Dirk. I must go wherever he goes. I worshipped you as no other woman was ever worshipped before. If I displeased you, you had only to tell me, and I'd have changed. I've done everything I could for you. Don't go, darling. Don't leave me. I can't live without you. If I've done anything to offend you, forgive me. Give me another chance. You don't know what Strickland Place is like. Wait! I'm not going to ask you to change your mind. But I want you to listen to me for a minute. You can't live on air. Strickland hasn't got a penny. Now may I go? No. I'll go. I can't bear to think of you living in that filthy attic. This is your home as much as it's mine. I'd like to leave the half of what I've got here. Will you pack up my clothes? and leave them with the concierge. I'll come for them tomorrow. I am grateful for the happiness you gave me in the past. I did not see Strickland for some time, but one day I ran straight into him and Blanche on their way to his favorite cafe. Out of curiosity, I accepted his invitation to a game of chess. Their attitude seemed so normal that I had the impression that they had settled down into a most domestic couple. obviously been spying on us. I was afraid he might have thought it disloyal of me to be there, but his concern was only for his wife. His want of spirit exasperated me, and I couldn't conceal my impatience with him. Look here, Dirk, you can't go on like this. You've got to pull yourself together. But I'm terrified for her. I know something is going to happen, something dreadful, and I can do nothing to stop it. What sort of thing? We haven't even any proof that she's unhappy. I have a terrible presentiment. Will you write to her for me? Why can't you write yourself? She doesn't read my letters. You don't know how important it is. Tell me what you want me to say. Dear Blanche, Dirk wishes me to tell you that if at any time you want him, he'll be grateful for the opportunity to be of service to you. His love for you is unaltered. But though I was just as sure as Dirk that the relationship between Strickland and Blanche would end disastrously, I did not expect the issue to take the tragic form it did. Dirk was awakened one night to learn that Strickland had left Blanche and 
that she had taken poison. He hurried to her, but she took And when he didn't go at once, her frenzy became almost uncontrollable. Three days later, Blanche died. After the funeral, Dirk wanted to go back to the studio alone. He could hardly believe she was dead. What had happened could only be a dream. A frightful dream. Then he saw that one of Strickland's paintings had been left behind. Curiosity got the better of him. It was a painting of Blanche, a nude painting of the woman he loved, made by the man who had destroyed her life. He wanted to hack it to pieces. And then he did an extraordinary thing. You left this picture in the studio. I thought I ought to bring it to you. Thanks. I... I nearly destroyed it. I wasn't entirely satisfied with it myself. Oh, it's a wonderful picture. I couldn't touch it. You are a very great painter. In a few days, I am leaving for Holland. That's where my parents live. They are simple people. My father is a carpenter. I wanted to ask if you'd come with me to Holland. There is room for you in my mother's house. I think the company of simple, poor people would do your soul a great good. I think you could learn something from them that would be useful to you. I've got other fish to fry. Goodbye, Strickland. You can have that picture if you like. Why do you want me to have it? I'm finished with it. It's no good to me anymore. see that wall? I'd see it if I looked at it. In that case, I think you can also see that I don't want to have any more to do with you. I confess I rather suspected it. Will you get this into your loathsome cranium once and for all? I don't want to know you. Are you afraid that I'll corrupt you? Look here, you've always said that you wanted to see my paintings. If you come with me now, I'll show them to you. I did not know why Strickland suddenly offered to show me the pictures but I couldn't resist the opportunity. I had a genuine horror of him, but side by side with it, a cold curiosity. The paintings I saw that afternoon are now owned by great museums and wealthy collectors. I wish I could say that I had once recognized their beauty and originality, but I realized that the paintings had power and that they gave me an emotion which I could not analyze.
I sense a prodigious effort in your work. You're like a tormented spirit trying to free itself. I'm not sure I don't pity you. You're a dreadful sentimentalist. Probably. I don't know a great deal about painting. I confess I was interested in seeing your pictures, mainly because I thought they might give me a clue to your character. You must write very bad novels. I'll have to read one sometime. I thought I might find some explanation of your horrible behavior to Dirk and Blanche Strover. What was horrible about it? Haven't you the slightest twinge of remorse? Why should I have? He saved your life. The absurd little man enjoys doing things for other people. Even if you owe him no gratitude, were you obliged to go out of your way to take his wife from him? Until you came on the scene, they were happy. Why couldn't you leave them alone? What makes you think they were happy? Wasn't it obvious? Do you think she could ever have forgiven him for what he did for her? What do you mean by that? Don't you know why he married her? No. She was a governess in the family of some Roman prince and got involved with the son of the house. They chucked her out. She tried to commit suicide. Dirk found her and married her. It was just like him. A woman can forgive a man for the harm that he does, but you can never forgive him for the sacrifices he makes on her behalf. That is without doubt the most cynical observation I've ever heard. It's true, just the same. Will you tell me why you bothered about Blanche Trevor at all? How do I know? She couldn't bear the sight of me. It amused me. I see. Well, if you must know, she attracted me. But why did you want to take her away with you? I didn't. When she said she was coming, I was nearly as surprised as Trevor. I told her that when I was through with her, she'd have to go. She said she'd risk that. Besides, I needed practice in painting the female figure. Why did you leave her? When I'd finished the picture, I no longer had any interest in her. And she loved you with all her heart. I don't want love. I haven't time for it. Love is a disease. It's weakness. I can't overcome my desire, but I hate it. It interferes with my work. Women can do nothing but love, and so they've given it a ridiculous importance. They try to persuade us that it's the whole of life. It's an insignificant part. Women have their place, but I have no patience with their claim to be partners and companions. You should have lived in the days where women could be bought and sold like cattle. It just happens that I'm a completely normal man. <laughs> women have small minds and are concerned with safety and security. They resent ideas because they can't understand them. They try to imprison a man in the circle of their account book. They want to possess your soul. You remember my wife? I saw Blanche, little by little, trying all her tricks. She cared nothing for me. She only wanted me to be hers. She was willing to do everything for me except the one thing I wanted, to leave me alone. What did you expect her to do after you left her? She could have gone back to Dirk. He was ready to take her. You're inhuman. It's as useless to talk to you about these things as to describe colors to a man who was born blind. Can you honestly say that you care whether Blanche Strove is alive or dead? You haven't the courage of your convictions. Life has no value. Blanche Strover didn't commit suicide because I left her, but because she was a foolish and unbalanced woman. We've talked enough about her. She was an entirely unimportant person. Do you think it's possible for any man to disregard others completely? When you're ill and tired and old, you come crawling back into the herd looking for sympathy. Anyhow, it's something very different I'm looking for now. And I've decided to leave Paris to search for it. Well, where are you going? I'm going to look for that island we once talked about. A tropical island. Where the sun is hot and the colors are strong. Maybe there I shall find what I want. It was the lovely island of Tahiti that Strickland came at last. If some years later my own travels had not brought me there also, I might never have discovered the strange and romantic events which prompted to write this book. I had not been in Tahiti long before I met Captain Nichols. The captain had a taste for gossip and whiskey, but he also had a wife who disapproved of both. For the moment, he had managed to elude her. He had heard that I was interested in Charles Strickland and had come to have a talk about him. I've had my coffee, thanks. But I don't mind having a drop of whiskey. 
<laughs> you don't think it's too early? You and your liver must decide that between you. Oh, I'm practically a teetotaler. I knew Strickland before he came out of the islands. Where did you meet him? In Marseille. Well, what were you oh, doing well, there? Well, I suppose you might almost say I was beachcombing. The only profession I've ever really envied. You know, I'm for king and country and all that sort of thing. England's the finest spot in the world, I'd say, and I ought to know, having been in most of them. But the authorities at home were all so infernally technical, do you know what I mean? I think I see your point. That's why I told Strickland to come to Tahiti. Tahiti's French, I said to him. The French aren't so blasted technical. Do you mind if I ask you a personal question? Not at all. Are you married? No, I'm not. Oh, you're a wise man, if I may say so. I wasn't married either when I knew Strickland and Marcel's, but I am now. Eight years ago, I took the plunge. I wondered why ever since. My wife doesn't approve of me. And yet she won't leave me. Now, how do you explain that? Have you ever tried to leave her? Indeed, I have. But I can no more escape her than the cause can escape the effect, if you know what I mean. Well, how did you come to marry her in the first place? I've often wondered. Her father was a policeman. Maybe that had something to do with it. I can't quite see... She, she frightens me. I suppose it must be in the blood. I face hurricanes, typhoons and wild beasts. But the very thought of Mrs. Nichols sets me all of a tremble. Well, in that respect, I can't say you resemble Charles Strickland. I'd like to see the woman who could make him tremble. Daddy, Mommy wants you. You see how it is. I'm sorry. This is my daughter and the image of her mother. Now run along, Lulu, dear, and tell your mother I'll be there directly. Single blessedness. How well I know the meaning of those words now. I don't suppose you could let me have 50 francs until tomorrow, could you? Yes. I seem to have left home without my wallet. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Won't you take this along with you? I'm very grateful for all the trouble you've taken. Oh, well, well, well yeah, uh, yeah, I'll just put my name on it and leave it here. This do? Oh, thank you very much, sir. Yes, indeed, I... Oh. If I had to get married, why didn't I let Tiara Johnson choose a wife for me, same as she did for Strickland? Do you mean Strickland married again in the islands? Daddy! She's getting impatient. Tiara Johnson will tell you about it. Tiara Johnson was the proprietress of the Hotel de la Fleur. She loved three things above all. A joke, a glass of wine, and a handsome man. Hospitality was a passion with her. And no one needed to go hungry when there was anything to eat at the Hotel de la Fleur. Although she herself was now too old and fat for romance, she took a keen interest in the amorous problems of the young and was always ready with advice and example from her own wide experience. I was only 15 when my father found out that I had a sweetheart. He was third mate on the Tropic Bird. Oh, he was a good-looking boy. What did your father do? He thrashed me within an inch of my life, then maybe marry Captain Johnson. Were you very unhappy? Oh, I didn't mind. He was handsome, too. He used to beat me regularly. I'd be black and blue all over for days at a time. He was a man. I cried when he died. Well, how long was it before you married again? Oh, a long time. <laughs> Nearly two months. <laughs> I've had six husbands, and now that that's all over, I'm the busiest matchmaker on the island. How on earth did you ever get Strickland married? I did very well with Strickland, if I do say so. Who was she? Her name was Arta. 
She was a sort of relation of mine on my mother's side. Her father and mother were dead, so I had her to live with me. She helped to do the rooms, and I taught her French and English. Strickland used to come here now and then to have a square meal or to play chess with one of the boys. Suddenly, I realized that Otto was taken with him. Otto put some food out for the leper. Paris sometimes, don't you get bored and lonely? I shall stay here until I die. That's how you feel, and there's something I want to say to you. You've got no money, and you can't keep a job more than a month. What you need is a woman to look after you. A man of your years should settle down. What do you say to marrying Arthur? In time, she settled down too. She's got a bit of property down by Taravao, and with Copra the price that it is, you could live quite comfortably. There's a house, and you could have all the time you wanted for your painting. And what do you say to that? Well, what does that to say to it? I have an idea that she's willing if you are. Atta, come here. Stand over there and let him have a look at you. Pretty enough, and she knows how to cook. I taught her myself. Well, Atta, you fancy me for a husband? <laughs> you see? She's sweet on you. Turn around and let him look at you. Beat you, you know. How else should I know you love me? <laughs> you see how sensible she is. That's a good girl, Anna. There's no hurry. Take plenty of time to make up your mind. Take a week. <laughs> Stay in the hotel as my guest and get better acquainted. Then, if you decide you want to marry her, we'll have a bang-up wedding. Everyone wore their store clothes to the church. I dug out my fourth husband's frock coat for Strickland. I guess he thought it was all pretty much of a joke, but I wept. I can't think why. Perhaps the frock coat brought back memories. The church was full of wasps, buzzing and lighting on everybody. But I hired some wasp swatters to protect the bride and groom. Islanders could hardly wait to get out of their clothes for the wedding feast, which we set out in a grove near Atta's house.
I told them to play the gayest tune they could and dance and dance. When I looked around for Atta, she was gone. I looked around for Strickland and he was gone too. I remember the time when I was 15 and I had a good cry. I was very happy. Otter's house was in a beautiful spot. There was a little stream nearby and the sea wasn't far away. Otter had a lot of relatives like all the islanders and they did the work around the place and helped with the coconut harvest. Then Otter had a baby, a jolly little baby. Strickland painted everything and everyone in sight, but he painted Atta most of all. Strickland once if he was happy with Otto. I'm very happy, he said. I feel differently about Otto somehow. If you ask me, he was in love with her and didn't know it. Dr. Kutra! Oh, Chiari, my darling. We were just talking about Strickland. Dr. Kutra knew him well. There's one thing that astonishes me. In Paris, Strickland was probably the most hated man I knew. Everyone thought him outrageous. I thought so myself. But here, people seem to have accepted him quite readily. Ah, oh, he was happy here. That's your answer. Strickland was no worse a man than any other. The only thing I could feel for him was pity. Why do you say that? Uh, he seemed to have an obsession. There was something he had to say, and the difficulty of expressing it tortured him. It's odd to hear you say that. I had the same feeling about him years ago. But Strickland was fortunate. He did get it out of his system. He painted it all on the walls of Arthur's house. It was all there, every bit of it. I should like to see that. Can't you see he's eaten up with curiosity? Go on, take him out on the terrace, and I'll send you two boys something to drink. Come along. She said I knew Strickland well, but that's not true. He was here a long time before I even met him. But when I finally did meet him, it was in the most shocking way. I was waylaid one day in Taravao by a young girl who begged me to visit a white man who was sick. By the time I reached the house, I was hot and tired and out of sorts. Hurry. Before I see anyone, give me something to drink or I shall die of thirst. Haven't I seen you before? Yes, I, I am Atta. Tierra Johnson is my cousin. Oh, I remember, you married an English painter. Where is he? In the house he is painting. I haven't told him we're coming. What does he complain of? If he's well enough to paint, he's well enough to have come to Tanabaro and save me this confounded work. I imagine my time is as well known as his.
I'm... I'm Dr. Kutra. Atta sent for me to see you. Atta's a blasted fool. I've had a few aches and pains lately, and a little fever. But it's nothing. Look at yourself in the glass. Don't you see anything strange in your face? Don't you see the thickening of your features and the look? How shall I describe it? The books call it lion-faced. My poor friend, must I tell you that you have a terrible disease? I. When you look at yourself in the glass, you see the typical appearance of the leper. You're joking. I wish to God I were. Do you mean to tell me that I have leprosy? Unfortunately, there's no doubt of it. They know. They know the signs well. They were afraid to tell you. Who knows? Sometimes the disease continues for 20 years. It's a mercy when it runs its course quickly. Take this picture. It means nothing to you now, but someday you'll be glad to have it. I don't want any payment. Take it. The bearer of important tidings should be rewarded. tears at her. There's no great harm. I shall leave you soon. They're not going to take you away. I shall go up into the mountains. You and the boy can go back to Papiti. Let the others go if they like. But I'll never leave you. If you leave me, I'll hang myself on the tree behind the house. I swear it. Why should you stay with me? Tiara will be glad to have you back. I will go where you go. Women are strange little beasts. If you can treat them like dogs, you can beat them until your arm aches and still they love you. Of course, it's an absurd illusion that they have souls. You're not going to leave me. I'll stay. Thank you. Thank you. Atta's relatives soon abandoned her. And finally she sent the old woman away with the baby. 
The women of the neighborhood were angry because she washed clothes in the brook and they egged their men on to stop her. People are all the same. Fear makes them cruel. They told her that if she used the brook again, they would burn down her house. I'm sorry, Ashley. something I wanted to say to you, Etta. But I can't seem to find the right words. Love? Time passes imperceptibly in Tahiti, and it must have been two years later that I heard Strickland was dying. The natives were uncommonly wrought up. I couldn't see them along the way, but I could hear the drums and the weird lament of the islands. The house was bedraggled and unkempt. Everywhere was desolation. Coconuts were rotting on the ground, the bush was encroaching, and it looked as if the forest would soon be once again in possession of that strip of land. was about. The door was wide open and the sickly sweet odor that surrounds the leper was almost overpowering. I went inside. But suddenly I seemed to have entered a metric world. Then I saw that there were paintings on the walls from floor to ceiling indescribably wonderful and mysterious. It was as if I were present at the beginning of a world. It was a sort of Garden of Eden, a hymn to the beauty of the human form and the praise of nature, sublime, indifferent, lovely and cruel. I was stunned. I knew that this was genius. Nothing had prepared me for the immense surprise of these awe-inspiring pictures in a native hut, far from civilization, in a fold of the mountains above Tanabao. <laughs> But it was 
blind. For nearly a year. He sat here with his pictures. He never complained. He said he had to become blind to see clearly. He became angry with me when I cried. But I couldn't help it. created a masterpiece, and then, in pride and contempt, he destroyed it. But in his last great paintings, he achieved what he wanted. His destiny was fulfilled. His life was complete.